Let's get into our weekly market review and see if it's time for the market to finally put in a bottom. And the other thing we got to talk about is if it's the final bottom of this bear market or if it's a temporary bottom, because those are two different things. You tend to get big, big bull rallies in bear markets. So when we talk about bottoms, we got to know the time frame too, short term or long term. Now, as always, we're going to use our research from MacroOps, our global macro research and consulting firm. And this week's review is called What Do We Want? Capitulation. Now, you remember we talked about capitulation in the last market review. And what capitulation is, is when everybody is absolutely sick of the market and they finally puke out. They get rid of all their investments, they sell everything, they're in cash. Capitulation is like the level of maximum distress. And remember, markets always go back to sentiment and positioning, right? So if the sentiment is extremely bearish, that's bullish for the market. Why? Because sentiment actually affects positioning. So if everyone is very bearish, then everyone has their money on the sidelines, they pulled it out. And if all the money is on the sidelines, then it only has one place to go, right? Back into the market, which is why very bearish sentiment and positioning or capitulation capitulation when you have both of them, that becomes bullish in the market in the sense that that's when you'll have a bottom. So unless you have total capitulation, you can't say that we're at a long-term bottom. Could be a short-term bottom, but most likely what you get in a short-term bottom, which is why it's called a short-term bottom, is you get a nice low rally and then you turn around and head lower. And not only do you head lower, but you head lower than where you previously were. So if you think about a double bottom basing pattern, what happens? You have the first low and then you have the second low that's even lower than the first one. That's the double bottom. But the second low, which is even lower than the first one, that's where everyone gets washed out because they thought that first one, oh, this must be the bottom, let's reinvest. And then they get kicked in the mouth again. So you're always looking for maximum pain in the market. That was another market wizard quote, which for some reason I can't remember anyone's names anymore, but he said that he's always looking for where the most people can get hurt. That's where he's invested. That was once again, Covenant or PTJ someone. If you know the quote, put it down in the comments. So getting into it, this is Bank of America's most recent flow show report summary. And the most interesting part to me doesn't have to do with equities, it's actually crypto. So they put a headline for the US today uh, back in August, 2021. Millennials are quitting their jobs to become crypto day traders. That's gotta make you chuckle because that's just how booms and busts happen, right? And now what we're facing is a huge crash in crypto that now rivals the internet bubble and the great financial crisis. So the trading pattern of post bubble assets always has furious bear rallies, which is what I was talking about before, amidst dead sideways trading ranges for a couple of years. So based off this, the crypto space is going to be tough for a while. And it seems like crypto in this new internet age, its cycles are just way, way faster because we already had the big bubble pop and kind of the bear market back in 2017, right after that peak, at least that's what I consider it. And now it's happening again, which I guess sped up cycles makes sense because it's the technology the future so it should move faster or maybe it's just more speculative stocks are old news crypto that's newer you're gonna get a lot more suckers you're gonna get Millennials quitting their jobs to become day traders but I read an article today from uh, Fred Wilson who's a pretty smart VC he was talking about how even though we've had this huge bubble pop in crypto and NFTs and everything coinbase is still investing heavily into the space now obviously that makes sense because coinbase is what a crypto exchange but his point is that the best companies continue to invest in sectors that they believe in even when they're out of favor because the truth hasn't changed right crypto sure is the future blockchain but on the way to that future you're going to get these speculative bubbles so the best companies aren't getting caught up in those and they're still just executing their plan they're investing even when it's not popular because yeah i mean look at coinbase right here down almost 90 percent it popped a little bit recently but it's been really brutalized but even so that company's executive management is still just executing their plan which is what you want to see in executives by the way you don't want them too focused on the stock price because then their incentives get a little messed up. They're going to go for short term moves that bump their stock price that helps uh, fill their pockets from their options. You don't want that in an executive team. But anyway, me personally, that's the type of crypto investment and focus I like to see, not the stupid day trading. You can see right here in the history of bubbles, here's tech in the late 90s. You can see Bitcoin, it just got ridiculous. Hey, even ARK is on there, which is funny. Moving on to equities, we've seen a short term flush out, which could be good for a temporary bottom, but we still have haven't seen the type of full scale liquidations that are needed to cement an enduring bottom. So what we're saying is we still haven't seen the capitulation. So we're in agreement with Bank of America on their capitulation checklist here. So Bank of America says, no, we're not at the bottom yet. Stocks are prone to an imminent bear market rally, but we do not think the ultimate lows have been reached. So what they do is compare their capitulation checklist of today's data versus COVID, the Euro debt crisis, the great financial crisis, the tech bubble, all the other bubbles, basically. And by the way, one thing to remember 
remember is that the strongest rallies in the market, you get them in bear markets. They're called bear market rallies. And they're way, way stronger than any bull market rally. And why is that? Well, it's because the market is always trying to cause the most amount of pain for the most amount of people. So those strong bear rallies always get people to think, hey, this market is finally bottomed, let's invest. So everybody invests at once and then they, again, get just kicked in the mouth, which is why you get that lower bottom like we were talking about. Anyway, going back to their checklist, their fund manager survey shows that cash levels are at 5.5% of assets under management. So these are for funds, right? That is a capitulation reading. So that's a high cash level. Growth expectations are at a negative 71%. That's capitulation. That matches up with the previous bubbles and their lows. Profit expectations, negative 63%. Capitulation as well. But that's where we end with the things that get checked off. Because right now, rate expectations are a positive 86%, which is not the standard at a bottom of the market because rate cut expectations are the ones you should be looking for. People think that the Fed is going to lower rates because the market is so bad. But right now, everyone believes they'll keep raising. Investment in equities are at a positive 6% still, which is low, but not low enough because a low in the market requires a negative 20 to 30% allocation. Private client equity is at 63%. Again, not capitulation because prior lows in the market saw equity allocations pull back to at least 56%. So more people need to be pulling their money from their hedge funds or investment managers in general. So equity inflows for every $100 inflows the past few weeks, we've seen just $4 of redemptions. But in previous bear markets, there's been over $50 of redemptions. If we look at equity redemptions as a percentage of assets under management, outflows are just 0.2% of AUM versus 3 to 6% at prior lows. So no, we aren't there yet. Just some interesting data points. JP Morgan has a great chart looking at historical aggregate positioning. So basically the conclusion is that past major bottoms took place only after more significant selling. So here are the past bottoms circled in red, and here's where we are in green right now. You can see we got some weight ways to go. So positioning isn't quite bad enough yet. No capitulation. There's still plenty of retail speculative positioning to unwind. And bizarrely, some indicators show retail is still piling into YOLO names like ARC, GME, and AMC. As recent as last week, people are not giving up. This is the type of entrenched Pavlovian stupidity that creates the behavioral and positioning cascade, which drive grinding bear markets. That's a mouthful, that sentence. Basically, these people continue to invest in these stocks. That's what's going to make this tough for the rest of us. Because again, we want everyone just puking, people to be completely done with the stock market. And the first thing to go should be investing in ARK, GME, and AMC, all the meme stocks. Not that ARK is a meme stock, but the other two are. But until that happens, until those Reddit boards are cleared, we're going to keep getting these bear market rallies with the lower lows and the sideways chop volatility that's been screwing all of us for a year. It's not an easy market. So tell your friends, just give them a call, say, hey, give up. It'll be better for all of us. Looking at the graphic here, ETF flows, you can see that they are still not down to their average because we had a huge, huge upswing, right, of people investing into ETFs. Well, we got some ways to go till capitulation. We could head all the way back down to this average trend. By the way, I hate saying the word capitulation. It just sounds bad and it doesn't feel good in my mouth. And you don't want things in your mouth that don't feel good, but I'll put them there for you guys. Our MacroOps proprietary trend fragility indicator, which aggregates various retail and hedge fund positioning, sentiment, and flow indicators fell to its third percentile on Friday. This is its lowest reading since the COVID bear market low. And a reading this low has a solid record of marking a temporary, if not major bottom, because based off this indicator, things are very bearish. But our guess is that it's the former, a temporary bottom, for the reasons we already discussed and more reasons that are coming. But our guess is that it's the former, the temporary, bottom. And that's because of the reasons we already discussed, plus some more data that's coming up. But what we're thinking now is that we could easily see a 6 to 10% bounce in the major indices over the next few weeks. So again, that's kind of that bear market rally. And you saw an example of it previously. This right here was a bear market rally. And this is the S&P that we're looking at right now. So since the low, it jumped up what? 11% just went straight up for a few weeks. That gets people excited until it turns around and goes even lower. So this leg down becomes even more brutal than this leg. Not only because we're hitting lower and lower prices, but because you had this little rally right here that gave people hope right before it was stripped away. So that's what we're looking at again, another uh, five to 6% rally up and then a collapse again. Just brutal, Mr. Market just wants to cause you pain. Now last Friday's 90% up volume day was supportive of this rally that we think is coming. So that was what? 
what, like Friday, and that was a 92% upside day. The first one since June 8, 2020. I remember what we talked about in previous videos, we always wanna see that breadth thrust to confirm at least a temporary bottom. We wanna see a bunch of stocks moving together. That shows us that the total market is healthier. You don't want just a few stocks going up and the rest still falling. You want that total breadth. The major indices reversed off major supports last week. Oh, this looks way better. Why didn't I do this with all the charts? Sorry, guys. But you can see uh, the major indices hit major supports. A lot of majors. But right here, and this is a weekly chart, you see the NASDAQ, this uh, candle right here, has a huge, huge wick. That's actually bullish because that means the buyers stepped in and prevented this thing from falling more, meaning there's buying pressure, which is good. So this should be good enough for a short-term bounce, but these six bear candles in a row, and these are weekly, remember, that's a very bad sign for the market. So consecutive bear or even bull bars like that show an imbalance in demand and supply. The higher the number of consecutive bars and the higher the time frame, meaning instead of just looking at daily charts, you look at weekly or even monthly, the higher the signal of the event. And by signal of the event, we mean how accurate do we think it's going to be. The longer you go out in time frame, like weekly charts versus daily, weekly are going to give you a better signal. Daily are going to give you a lot more noise. You're going to see a lot more failed breakouts. You go down to the minute charts, oh, everything's going to break down. Most of it is noise. So zooming out is always a good strategy. So when we look at six weekly bear bars, that's a large bearish impulse. And that typically leads to more downside in the months ahead. And you can see this right here with our calculations. Average returns for the NASDAQ 100 after six week bear bars, you can see the maximum return is negative. That's this green line right here. And obviously the minimum is even worse, but nothing real positive. Doesn't look good in the following months when you see this type of action. Now, just like the NASDAQ, the small caps also reversed off a major support, which is always good to see. JP Morgan has some new data out showing that investor flows into defensive relative to cyclicals are hitting extremes. So what do we know about markets when they're turning around? People start going into defensive stocks, right? But that is now hitting an extreme. So as long as the market doesn't completely fall apart right here, if we get that bear rally we're talking about, then we might be in for some strong mean reversion favoring cyclicals, meaning people are going to pile some money into there and those cyclical names that have been getting crushed might actually recover a bit. Here's some more interesting data from Bank of America. What they're doing is comparing 20th to 21st century PE ratios for US stocks. So in the past, we actually averaged around 14. And when I say past, I mean in the 20th century. But since we've been in the 21st century, it's been around around 19. You can see here, 14 during all this time, the Great Depression, the oil crises. But since the millennium, we've been around 19. But now Bank of America thinks we'll finally be reverting back to this 14 level. So they believe that secular inflation, driven by trends in society, including inequality, politics, which we've been facing a lot of populism, geopolitics, war, society, inequality and inclusion, environment, the economy, which is the end of globalization, demographics, like China's population decline. It all means higher inflation, higher rates, and a reversion of the PE to the norm. So it's been 14 to 16 for the past 120 years. And now finally, they think it's going to come down from 19. And based off that, a good entry level into the S&P would be around the 3,600 to 3,800 level. But what usually happens is that we undershoot those levels. Because look at right here in all these times, look where the PE went. So the S&P could very easily go below these levels, but that would be around fair value before PEs can become somewhat inflated again and then come down again and then go up again and then come down again for the rest of our lives. Goldman Sachs suggests that we're moving into a new postmodern cycle. We're going to explain what that means in a second, but it's important to understand the difference between narrative adoption and large secular changes that are actually happening. Narratives swing back and forth much faster than changes on the ground actually occur. And narratives like the new postmodern cycle are quickly becoming consensus. So again, markets are all about expectations and expectations create cycles. So you get a bunch of hype that pushes things up and then a bunch of despair that pushes them down, right? Bubbles popping. But those cycles that happen, happen over a trend too. So if you look through the cycles and kind of trace the average, you might see a line going up like this, or a line going down like this. It depends on the trend. Simple example is this market right now, right? It was up, it went down, it went up again. Now it's down again, it'll probably go up. See, this is real smart analysis, right? Up and down. But the point is you could take a line and say, hey, 
this trend is going down. And that's kind of the same thing that we're saying here about narrative adoption. So people, you know, they all believe one thing or another. For example, like this postmodern thing we're gonna talk about, all of a sudden everyone believes it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the actual secular changes happen. And if people don't believe in the narrative, it doesn't mean that the secular changes are stopping. It's just what's popular and what's not. And those narratives drive prices over the short term, but over the long term, of course, prices are tied to secular changes. See how everything ends up being the same thing with cycles at the end of the day? But okay, pre-1980s, we had the traditional investment cycle. So this was generally short and volatile booms and busts and periods of high and low inflation and interest rates. So investors typically needed a high dividend yield to compensate for the risks in equity markets because they traded differently back then. Then from the early 1980s, we hit the modern cycle and that was characterized by more stability and predictability. It benefited from sustained falls in inflation, falling interest rates and the risk premium. So geopolitical tensions eased and supply side reforms accompanied waves of deregulation. There was no more capital controls and we got deeper capital markets and stronger world trade growth. So the new era of globalization that we had drove profit shares and GDP to record highs. It was a great time. Independent central banks and forward guidance contributed to longer and less volatile economic cycles. So the banks were working great. Everything was good, relatively, in this time, at least for the market. Now we are entering the postmodern cycle. This is post the pandemic, and it's likely to be driven by a different set of macro conditions and priorities, meaning we're going to have to invest different. So do we know exactly how these new postmodern markets will work? No, we don't. And remember, this narrative could become very popular, but what you really want to focus on is the actual secular changes and see when those come through. So that's something we'll be watching. Now, we talked about cyclicals coming back into fashion, right? As people move from defensive in this bear market rally. Well, if that happens, then this stock Micron, MU, might be worth a look. And we've talked about them a ton, I know. But right now, they're trading as cheap as they could get. And they're the major long-term support. This is a monthly chart right here. You can see they're hitting this support level. So we might be in a good place to enter. Of course, we got to see if this bottom holds, this temporary bottom. But this is a great play because the secular case for being bullish DRAM and NAND, I still don't know how to pronounce it. It's still very much in play. AI and microchip demand, it's not going away. But of course, you got to be careful and you got to be light on your feet because we're in a big transitional period right now. And we talked about what's happening in this video right here. And if you haven't watched it, it's important to watch because it shows what's happening now after the buildup of the last 10 or so years. And in that video, we got our frenemy Dalio helping us to figure out what's going on. So click this video right here and I will see you there.